Hello, and welcome to my talk about the thorny piece of malware. My name is Marian. I'm a malware analyst. I'm going to spare you my second name now because people seem to have problems pronouncing it anyway. And I work for the Austrian software company, Ikero Security Software. My talk is going to be about one specifically thorny piece of malware I analyzed in and out. And I'm going to start off with some fancy fun facts about that sample. And the rest of the talk is all going to be about analysis issues I had when looking into that. I'm going to bring two anti analysis techniques I encountered in the sample and two more analysts' headaches that uh, still provide problems for reverse engineers. Uh, first one of that is uh, exception handling that can obfuscate the execution path. Uh, second one is chunk code I encountered in there that was pretty nasty at first glance but then easy to pass by after all. I'm going to talk about uh, binary analysis of C++ executables and uh, about multi-threaded applications for reverse engineering. All right, let's start over. Now, altogether, this is my favorite piece of malware. Now, why would it be my favorite piece of malware? Well, I reversed it in and out from top to bottom, and I really had a lot of fun. It is a challenging piece of malware, but uh, not impossible to pass by, even for beginners. It's not packed or encrypted but still provides a lot of interesting topics to research. Uh, but what does it do after all? Well, altogether, I summarized it here. It's an Asian, multi-threaded, non-polymorphic, file-infecting spy bot. Now, what's it do? Like, what spy bots do? Um, it can produce screenshots. It can produce screen captures and send them to a CNC server. It can delete files. It can copy files. It can execute files. Most of all, it can uh, update itself so it can download a new version of itself and execute this one. So basically it can do anything the uh, malware controller wants to. Anyway, what were the interesting facts about it? This sample uses structured exception handling to obfuscate its execution path. That means um, by throwing deliberate exceptions, the malware author can uh, pass execution control from one place in the executable to another one, namely the exception handler. And the interesting thing about exception handlers is, in an exception handler, you can define a new entry point that's going to be executed after the exception handler. Now, how does this work? Well, the most accurate documentation I could find still was written in 1997 by a guy called Matt Pietrek, who's one of my big heroes now because he really did a really nice documentation on this issue. Namely, the crash course in the depth of, uh, well, you can read it. Uh, here comes the summary um, of this article. Actually, uh, exception handling is implemented as a chain of exception handlers, which is located on the stack and intertwined with the function stack frames that are on there. And it all starts at the thread information block, because every thread has its own uh, uh, chain of exception handlers. A reverse engineer can find this uh, through the FS register, it offsets zero, which points to an exception registration structure, which looks more or less like this. In the simplest case, the structure contains a pointer to the handler, which could eventually handle uh, the thrown exception, and a pointer which points to the previous registration block, which looks like this. And eventually, in the end of the chain, there comes a default handler, and, well, a minus one. All right, now this is based on the stack, intertwined with the function stack frames. And there's a whole science about building the stack and unwinding the stack. But what's really interesting for a malware author is, of course, he can register his own exception handlers and deliberately throw uh, exceptions and control, like, put uh, point to execution flow to some other piece uh, in the code. Now, this looks more or less like this. If you're inside of a binary and can spot something like FS0 and see the structure, uh, where a new reverse, uh, sorry, a new exception handler is linked into that list, that uh, most likely has to do with exception handling. Now, I told you there's a pointer in there pointing to the handler code, which would be the first switch to some other point in the executable for execution. And inside of this handler now, someone can change the, um, the execution flow to a completely different point inside of the executable. The magic thing about this is an exception is treated as a software interrupt, which means every time an exception occurs, the whole context structure of the thread that's running is saved away and loaded back into the CPU when the exception handler is finished. 
And the interesting thing there is that someone can change this context structure and point the instruction pointer somewhere completely different. So yeah, I know there's a lot of people in here getting excited when they hear they can point instruction pointers somewhere. Right, now till today, a lot of things have changed, especially concerning C++. And in Visual C++, well, it's still based on structured exception handling, I showed you before. But the things have changed mainly is that now every function has uh, its own exception handler and uses a func infrastructure which contains information about try blocks and catch blocks. And I think I need to take a break. <laughs> You'd be correct. <laughs> yes. We have a little tradition here at DEF CON. Let me tell you all about it. It involves. Three. Louder. Three. Why? Why are we making her drink? Do we have any first timers here in the audience? I don't. So there really nobody's a first timer? None? No, wait. Okay, who's everybody pointing at? All right, get up here. <laughs> I can't believe this is the only guy. That's amazing. Cheers. Welcome to DEF CON. <laughs> Have a good talk. Thank you. <laughs> Where were you? Wait, that's, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, right there. <laughs> okay, now where was I? All right, uh, Visual C++ structure deception handling. It's still based, sorry. <coughs> it's still based on the principle of structured exception handling I, I showed you before, but now every function has its own dedicated exception handler which is compiler generated and uses some structure called func infrastructure that contains a lot of information, namely information for uh, unwinding funclets about try blocks and catch blocks and um, well a lot of pointers to the exception handlers that eventually handle exceptions. Right. There's a built-in function called CXX frame handler which uh, this func infrastructure is handed over to and then performs well the magic around exception handling to execute exception handlers. Well, of course. And still as I mentioned, the important thing there, the exception handler can define a new entry point. Now, I pointed some really nice diagram that's to be seen here. Uh, interesting, right? On OpenRC, it is painted by uh, Igor Skokinski, who did a lot of research on structured exception handling. And I've provided some scratchbook painting here. It's really not that pretty, but let's look through that. There's a pointer to the exception handler on stack, right? That's the compiler generated exception handler. There's the CXX frame function where the func infrastructure ends up at. Um, this pointer points to a try block map. The try block map points to a handler array. The handler array points to a handler offset, which points finally to a handler. Um, you got it all, right? Well, I provide some pretty rare screenshots here from either pro. Uh, let's get back to the bot. In practice, this would look like this. For example, there's a registration sequence. I hope people can read this, maybe, I don't know. Well, there's the F0 flying by and a new exception handler is registered at the beginning of a function. And sometime later, there's an exception happening. If you can read that call, this will almost never work, right? Because this memory address put to ECX there is somewhat likely not to be valid. So there's the exception and the registered uh, sorry, the registered exception handler, which uh, causes the system to execute the compile generated handler. There, the func infrastructure is handed over to the CXX frame handler, which then performs the magic. Um, let's look into this func infrastructure. In this func infrastructure, there's the values that Igor thankfully pointed out in his diagram. So there's the try block map and the handler array, and finally the pointer to the handler that the user registered. So there's the user generated handler and in there you can find the offset to the new entry point. 
If you have a look at the user generated handler, um, it is really obvious that this handler is just uh, registered for obfuscation because there's nothing else happening there than the setting of this offset for the new entry point. All right, so much about exceptions. The second point, the chunk code in the file. Um, there was uh, really quite a lot of, of chunk code defined in that sample, which is pretty scary for young analysts if you see a lot of um, source and a lot of shifting operations and a lot of uh, loops that actually don't perform any any really useful information in there. So um, I was kind of overwhelmed, overwhelmed by all this uh, chunk code until I found the principle of the chunk code in my sample. There's a whole lot of research about chunk code in binary files and the principle of this chunk code was pretty simple. It were opaque predicates. Now an opaque predicate is something that just, well, a branch statement that always returns true or always returns false. And so it's always going to be just execute one branch of uh, the branches that there are. And the other branches guess the chunk code. So, well, in the sample analyst, it's a, uh, it looked somewhat like this. On the right side, you see that I post screenshot. On the left side, there's a simplified version. And if you think through that, the compare statement in the end is never going to produce any zero flags, so the jump not zero is always going to take the green branch. Right. You think now this is simple? It's true. It was like this all throughout the sample. It was just as simple. So what did the analyst do? Um, I just put the ignore mode on and uh, green branch for president. If you can see these graphics, I'm not sure how the person, ah, yeah, right. So yellow boxes are the productive code and the white boxes are just chunk code. So this was really pretty simple to get by. Analyst headaches. I spent a lot of time in that sample and had a lot of headache, uh, especially because of the threads in there. People who have seen the movie Drag Me to Hell know what I've been through with that application. Um, the author of the sample actually has all my respect because he produced this in C++. This is a simplified version of the threads that I found in there. There's actually a lot more, but it boils down basically to one thread that manages um, the whole instance, namely the, well, the fun, so the bot instances that could start up on the system because eventually there's more than one files infected that could start up. Uh, second thread, there was the file infector always infecting uh, processes that would start up. A thread machinery that uh, would handle the sending side of the bot which could send messages and data to the CNC and one side that was the receiving side of the bot and of course the CNC command switching. Now how did I get to that information? That was pretty tricky and I spent a lot of try and error time in there. But actually what I did was in four steps um, I realized that I have to spot the, the really interesting threads because there's a lot of timing overhead and synchronization going on. After doing this, I had to spot the interfet communication and the synchronization methods, which actually told me a lot about what threads were about, were triggered by specific events. I will talk a little bit more about this uh, pretty soon. In the third step, of course, I had to analyze uh, somewhat the function bodies of the threads to really find out what they do, what information they generated, and where this information would eventually flow to. Knowing all of this, in the first step, I could bring down this big picture of where is information generated, which thread, uh, which thread, sorry, accepts this information, processes it, and eventually takes any action. All right, so if you go back to that diagram, I found four different methods of synchronization in there, which were events for triggering um, the file infector and for managing the different instances that were started, thread messages, which were mainly used at the receiving side of the bot, IO completion port, which was used to manage the, um, so yeah, the receiving side of the bot, the thread messages for the sending side of the bot, and the critical sections for data exchange between the threads. And when I had that, I could uh, paint the threads around the synchronization methods. All right, now here comes the last nastiness for today, C++. Uh, there's actually a lot about reversing of C++. There's a whole science. For people who are interested in that, I collected a lot of links on that research on the last slide of this Prezi. Um, but what I actually want to talk about are virtual function calls. Uh, virtual function calls are really interesting to reverse because they're indirect calls 
and they're only fully determinable at runtime. They stem from the multiple inheritance feature of C++. So one of these virtual function calls can actually call into several different methods at runtime. They're translated uh, using virtual function tables, which also have a lot in reversing uh, these sorts of binaries. I provided uh, an example here. In this example, there's a virtual function table actually loaded into the register EAX. And at offset four of this virtual function table, there's a method that's going to be called with this call statement. There was really sort of a catch me if you can. Um, actually, I collected another sample from OpenRC and Igor Skokinski because he did a lot of research on this as well. Um, here's one class A where there's two virtual functions defined in there. Underneath this class definition, you can see the memory layout of class A where there's a virtual function pointer actually pointing to the virtual function table of class A. Now a virtual function table is something that just class have that have virtual functions defined in there. All right, and here's the second class B which also has a really similar layout with two virtual functions defined in there. And another interesting thing is the class C because class C inherits public class A and class B and implements one virtual function each. Now, the memory layout of class C is somewhat bigger because as it inherits other classes, it has to include their, uh, their class layout and also the virtual function pointers in there to the virtual function tables. Just that these virtual function tables are now adapted to fit the needs of class C and point to the actual function offsets of the functions that class C implemented. All right, this is really dry to look at at code. Now back to business, here's the uh, CNC command switching function which is a really good example for virtual function calls. On there you see a lot of yellow boxes. This is all memory allocation for objects that are going to be instantiated in the green boxes. And then you see this one pink box which is the virtual function call which was actually used to um, call into the bot functions. The bot functions are implemented as derived classes from one bot action superclass and all had one function overloaded, uh, so, sorry, implemented that was the bot action. Now I provide here another other pro example with um, the move file object. Here in yellow you see the object instantiation, uh, sorry, the uh, memory allocation where there's space reserved for the object that's going to be instantiated a little bit later in the green box. And what you see there is a call to a constructor. Now this constructor actually has a call into the superclass constructor. Does it work uh, with derived objects? And there you see the first VF table flying by. Uh, I will talk about this in a second. As I mentioned, this constructor has a call into the base class constructor. And there you see another virtual function table where there's space reserves for two virtual functions. Now in either pro, if you check the cross references of this base class constructor, there are 23 cross references. And now guess, surprise, there's like 23 bot actions that can be taken by the bot. All right, now knowing this, um, the final step is the instance, uh, sorry, the call into the function method of the move file object. And what you see there is that the function table of the move file object is loaded into the register and uh, the function offset 4 is called. Now if you have a look at the virtual function table of the move file object, at offset 4 there is the move file function. So theory approved. Using these virtual function tables, you can um, not easily but pretty fast uh, determine which functions are going to be called at these virtual function calls. All right. This was my presentation. Here are the promise to yourself links. The sample is to be found online under the first link. And well, if there's any questions, you can contact me on Twitter or I'm going to be out in the hallway to answer your questions or receive critics or anything you want to tell me now. Thank you. <laughs>